how crazy it is right now, you, if you have children at 11, 12, 13 years of age and say, you know what, we're going to a third world country. Everything was going well, you know, I'm living my life, getting back acquainted, you know, got crazy stories to tell my friends in New York about Colombia and my experiences. And then boom, 9-11 happens. <music> Dímelo, mi gente. This is Mike Perez with Mi Gente Podcast. Once again, my name is Mike Perez, and I'm going to tell my story. It has a little bit of everything, guys. It has drugs, violence, hard times, but it also has high-end living, luxuries, and all the beautiful things and everything else in between. So this here is my story. Born in in 1978, yes, 1978, to a Dominican dad and Colombian mother. Crazy mix, I know. I don't know how that happened, but it happened, guys. I am a, what you call a Colombian, Colombian and Dominican. And it all started in the streets of Washington Heights where I was born, which is uptown New York in Manhattan. Born, like I said, from a Dominican dad, Colombian mom, but we stayed in Washington Heights, which is a predominantly Dominican neighborhood. So if you have gone to Dominican Republic and you have gone to Washington Heights, you'll see it's exactly the same, except that they have subways and they have sky rises. Other than that is the same thing. Bachata in the air, platanos 10 for a dollar, kids running around, fire hydrants, in the summertime, wedding everybody. And it was a beautiful time in New York. Beautiful time. We loved it. I didn't know any better. So obviously, you grow up in that environment. You live that environment. You embrace that environment. And you become that environment, right? So living in New York, it wasn't easy, you know. But my parents bust their butts. My dad worked in Times Square, which we thought... It was the greatest thing in the world because everybody knows Times Square, the flashing lights, the traffic, the noise, the people. It's beautiful. You know, you see it in the movies. And my dad sold electronics in Times Square. So he dealt with a lot of um, tourists that were visiting the city. So my dad was the breadwinner in the house. My mom was a housewife, but she was also a true hustler. My mom always had some side gigs. She cleaned actually floors in the World Trade Center, believe it or not. You know, she worked in the textile industry. I remember being a little kid, my mom uh, taking me with her to work. So New York was great. You know, we lived, uh, you know, with the Dominican side of my family. Pretty much we all lived in the same two blocks, grandmother, uncles, cousins, so it was always great. Good times, everybody together, everybody just um, seeing each other for the holidays, etc. And that was really the Washington Heights culture, that Dominican culture that I was actually being brought up as. And fast forward, you know, school's happening, things are going. And yeah, it was tough. You know, I had to sometimes take the, the long way home or the long way to school just to avoid certain people, certain gangs, certain situations. But it was all inevitable, you know. Yes, I got mugged a few times. And um, yes, I would get home crying and, Mom, they stole my watch. Oh, my God, you know, they did this, they did that. So things like this started occurring. You know, the crack pandemic was super, super crazy high during the 80s. So I was exposed to that. And I think about it now that I'm an adult. It was a crazy environment to be in, you know. Elevators smelling pissy and horrible as ever, crack bottles everywhere, bums everywhere, you're pretty much exposed to to really rough, a really rough environment when you're a kid, you know? And during all that time and during all those experiences, my parents, my mom especially, decided to say, you know what? I think we've had enough. I don't think you're going to come out of this environment you know, as a, as a great person. So what did they do? They decided to make 
the big move, which was, you know, for my parents coming from their country, Colombian Dominican Republic to the United States for that American dream, quote unquote. Now we're actually leaving the U.S. where people build that American dream. And now my parents tell me, you know what, Mike? Mijo, nos vamos para Colombia. I was like, what? She's like, nos vamos para Colombia. This is rough. Esto está muy duro. El ambiente está muy pesado. And at that time, I was uh, 12 years old, you know? I'm already running the streets, you know, because in New York, you, you do grow up fast. Um, nine, 10 years old, I'm already taking the subway without my parents knowing. As long as I had three, four bucks in my pocket, enough for the train, which was back then a dollar fifty. If I had three dollars, I can take the train and come back home. And if I had an extra two dollars and fifty cents, that was a slice of pizza and a twenty five dollar uh, twenty five cents juice. If I had three, four bucks, I can go anywhere in the city, you know, which was crazy. You know, my parents never knew. I would be like, Mom, I'll be back. I'm going to the corner. Yeah, right. I would go from Washington Heights to Brooklyn, Washington Heights to the Bronx, Washington Heights to Manhattan. Seen all kind of crazy stuff, prostitution, drug dealers, drug addicts, all the craziness. And yes, they decided that that's not something I should be exposed. So it was crazy when my parents said that we're going uh, to Colombia because I was scared. You know, I had all my friends in New York. I had all my cousins from my Dominican side of the family that we got along very, very well. We were very close. Every single holiday season, we would go down the block. Go see grandma because all 20 cousins and 18 uncles and aunts were going to be there because we all lived in the same area. So it was a very tight knit family environment in Washington Heights. And I love that. But when my parents said we're going to Columbia, that's a whole different thing. And they made it happen. And I look back once again, how crazy it is right now. You, if you have children at 11, 12, 13 years of age and say, you know what? We're going to a third world country. How will that make you feel? You know, it might be scary because you're going from the land of opportunity to the land of technology. Even if it was the 80s, it was still advanced. And now we're going to South America. You know, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was an experience. And definitely that experience when we get to Colombia, when we get to the city of Pereira, for those who are not very familiar, it's close to Medellin. Pereira is where the paisas come from. They have that accent. And um, when I get to Colombia, I hated it. I hated Colombia. I was depressed. I was sad. I was mad, you know, because uh, how dare you take me from New York you know, the city of dreams where I had all my friends to now a place that I don't know anybody. I don't even know the language. You know, I understand Spanish because my parents and uncles spoke it, but I wasn't fluent. So that right there, my first year in Colombia sucked, you know, um, didn't have no friends. The few friends that I did have, even when they try to say hi, I wouldn't know how to talk. So they would look at me like I was some funny, crazy looking kid, you know, and of course I dress different. I'm very hip hop influenced, especially back then. So imagine you got your hip hop gear and now you're moving to Colombia and mind you, a very, very nice neighborhood. Everybody's very hoity toity, which I'll get into that. But um, but yeah, it was hard. It was hard. And then um, going to the schools, getting registered when they ask you questions, you're like, what? So, yeah, it was a, it was an experience, but little by little, you know, you have to adapt, you know, just we're humans. We adapt and we have to, you know, it is what it is pretty much. So living in New York and from New York, now in Colombia, months go by. I'm still in my room. I don't want to go nowhere. The only people that were actually taking me out were my uncles, you know, because those are the only people that were there. My uncles on my mom's side. So I would chill a lot with my uncles go and hang out with them. One of them had taxis. So I would hang out with him while he was doing his, his taxi runs. And little by little, I started kind of like saying, you know what, this is not bad. 
especially because, you know, living in Colombia and in Washington Heights is not like the most luxurious type of living. We lived in a small apartment, you know, in, in, in Manhattan, 177 in Broadway. I still remember. And, yes, yeah, roach infested and, you know, as clean as we could keep that apartment, it was still just a regular New York City uptown apartment. To now in Colombia, moving to a beautiful high rise where everything is luxury. Everything is, is totally different. It's black and white, the yin and the yang. So who doesn't love that? Who doesn't love luxuries? Even as a kid, the commodities and all those stuff, you start saying, you know what? This is not that bad. My parents bought a really nice car. The environment was totally different. So I start going to school in Colombia. Obviously, I needed tutoring because my Spanish was not very good looking at that time. But, um, but little by little, like I said, I started making friends. I started getting used to the whole situation in Colombia. You start adapting. That's really what it is. You start adapting. And when you start meeting people and, and getting acclimated to your environment, then I started embracing that. And what environment was that? We went from freaking New York to now hiring maids. We had chauffeurs. We could even get a cook if we wanted to, but my mom cooks too good, so we left that alone. But, um, but yeah, started my life in Colombia. I miss my friends and my Dominican side of the family dearly, but then I had my other family, my other culture, because I went from two extreme cultures, the Dominican side, straight bachata, merengue, loud, crazy, to my Colombian side, which was a little more calm down, un poquito más tranquilo, más pasivo, but we always had a great time. Now, my time in Colombia was, what, from my 12 years old all the way to 19, and I lived a lot. I lived a lot in Colombia, and you don't think so, but when you are in a neighborhood or in a in an area where social classes are very obvious, you start getting that type of lifestyle. In Colombia, for those who don't know, there is what we call estratos, which translates to um, social classes. That's really what it is. In Colombia, tenemos estrato uno, all the way to estrato seven, meaning that, numero uno, you're pretty much poor, dirt, dirt poor, all the way to estrato seven, which now you're with the elite, the politicians, just people in power in Colombia. And because my dad, when they all decided to take us to Colombia to live for a better life, of course, my mom and dad did a huge sacrifice because for them, it wasn't like, hey, we're all going to Colombia and staying there. No, it was actually my dad would work in the United States in Times Square, make his money by himself six months so he can actually come to Colombia for the remainder of the six months of the year so he can spend time with us, you know? So it sucked in a way because, yeah, there was many times I didn't have my dad. My mom was mom and dad at times when we were in Colombia. And then when my dad comes back, it was just having fun, you know? So a lot of things happen during that time and you end up growing and thinking you're powerful because now you're in this different estrato. My dad is making dollars and my dad making dollars, taking them to Colombia. We were living a freaking amazing life, you know, from once again, from New York, the concrete jungle. Now we're living in Colombia where there's country clubs, chauffeurs, private schools, Pretty much you have money, you could do whatever you want. You know, I remember being pulled over in Colombia with my friends because there was a curfew. At a certain age, you shouldn't be driving or in the streets in Colombia at a certain time of the year because a lot of stuff was going on with uh, the narcs, you know, narcotraficantes and the whole drug thing. So there was a point that if you were 15 or under, you shouldn't be in the streets. And us thinking we're big shots because now I'm mingling with people that lived in these places. And a lot of these kids were, their parents were doctors, were lawyers, were 
huge drug dealers. So I was with elite people from different backgrounds of life, from professionals, corporates, all the way to drug dealers. And that was big back in that time. So living those those two cultures, you know, in New York, then going to Colombia, I was exposed to the poor of the poor all the way to the best of the best. Now, I don't know, maybe that's one of the reasons why I stay very neutral. I could say I try to stay humble because I've seen it all. I've seen I've seen us have nothing all the way to having everything, to having nothing, to having everything again. So it's no big deal. I, we can survive with, with anything, you know, with having money or having just us. All right? So in Colombia, it was, it was just an experience, you know, uh, when would you think that I was this kid from New York, from Washington Heights, Dominican kid, all of a sudden in fincas, riding horses, Paso Fino, you know, um, checking out ganado and, 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 you know, just doing things that people in Colombia do that I would never have done in New York. So for me, I started taking all that in and started loving the lifestyle, you know, the lifestyle that you have in Colombia when you have money. And when you have money, you have power, you know. We could buy policemen. We can get whatever the hell we wanted. And we got away with a lot of stuff, you know. And we had fun, you know. We're freaking 15, 16, 17 years old. But all that happened, you know. My dad, six months. My mom, my mom uh, six months uh, away from my dad. And once again, now that I'm saying this and I look back, I'm like, damn. They did. They did a crazy sacrifice because once again, and I'll ask all of you guys out there, how easy would it be if you have two, three kids, you move to a different country, but your spouse six months stays in one country, six months comes to the other. I think about it. and I'm like, damn, that's that's a sacrifice. It really is because I don't think I'll be able to do it. And when I mention it to other people nowadays, they would never do it. And we actually have more technology and more things that we can actually make that possible. But it's a big move. It's it's complicated. It's it's not easy, you know, but we made it work, you know, living there, went to high school over there in Colombia. And when you're about to finish high school. You start getting these assessments, you know, physical assessments, you know, you're about to finish high school. We got to see how you are. Um, are you the only child, the only male? And yes, I was, uh, I'm the, I'm the first, I'm a male. Uh, I already had, uh, my Colombian citizenship because if you live in Colombia for over a year, you can get your citizenship and you become a citizen. And I actually had do and even three citizenship citizenships at one time. So being a Colombian resident, Colombian citizen, once you actually graduate from high school, being a male, you have to give one year of military service to the country, which some people consider it somewhat of a communist type of thing. Colombia wasn't communist back then, but that's that's pretty much how it worked. And um, some parents who had a lot of money, they would actually just say, you know what, my son is not going to no military, especially when back in the 80s and 90s, a lot of... Uh, the narcotraficante, a lot of the drug stuff was going on and, and the guerrillas was big. So they were taking a lot of us young people straight from high school to the jungles of, you know, El Choco. And, you know, for those who know, El Choco is deep in the mountains in Colombia where the guerrillas were at. So all these assessments that they were doing in high school when we were about to graduate was really just preparing you and seeing if you were able to do the military service. And at that time, I'm already spoiled. You know, I've been living in Colombia six, seven years already. I'm thinking I'm a big shot. I'm a millionaire, you know, just like everybody in, in, in my surroundings, in my environment. I said, hell no, I'm not doing that. Mom, go buy me, pay for that. Like, it was that easy. My mom's like, hey, no, no, that's expensive. I'm not going to go uh, uh, to El Choco and fight the gorillas at 18, 19 years old. And then my mom is thinking about it. She's like, sheesh, you're right. I'm freaking taking you from New York 
to get away from the drug dealers and the gangs and the drugs and all that rough environment take you to Colombia for a better life and now you're might I might lose you because you're going to go fight guerrillas and and do military service over there so that's when we decided to leave Colombia once again or just leave Colombia and now exercise my american citizenship and say you know what this blue passport gives me the the right to not do military here in Colombia and go back to my hometown which is the US New York so that's exactly what happened i was the first one my parents my mom and my sister stayed in colombia my sister stayed in colombia and they sent me to the us to back home where my dad is at because my dad at that time those are his six months of being in the states so now i'm back with dad what's up dad i'm back i'm in new york i get to see my old friends from back in the day um you know 8 years later so kind of rekindling those relationships some people changed some people didn't which sucks some people just stayed in the same damn place which that's one big thing of a lot of folks that live in uh in New York New York is beautiful New York is is great but i had that mentality that New York was the best and to be honest when you experience other cultures other worlds other environments you realize that New York is not the best it's good but it's not the best you know so now i'm in the states back got rid of you know got away from the whole military thing i'm starting to find work you know what is there to do you know i i was going to school for uh programming you know getting into the whole tech stuff back then it was it was big you know coding and and sql and p you know a whole bunch of stuff and I started going to school by the Merrill Lynch Bull. For those who know New York on Foreign Broadway, that big Merrill Lynch Bull that's made of metal or something like bronze or something like that. I was going to school a block from there and I was working two blocks from there. So everything was in that area. Everything was going well, you know. I'm living my life, getting back acquainted, you know got crazy stories to tell my friends in New York about Colombia and my experiences and then boom 9/11 happens 9/11 happened and it threw a curveball cuz here I'm thinking that hey I'm back home I'm back in New York let me get back into the groove and now 9/11 happens and unfortunately in that area a lot of those buildings got damaged a lot of that area was condemned they closed it off so now no school and no work and i'm like shish what what am i going to do now my sister one of my sisters at that time she was living in virginia and um she i call her up and i'm like sis i don't have a job everybody here is unemployed i'm in a fair a work a job fair and i'm doing lines with ceos who are willing to take a pay cut just so they can work you know so i'm like i'm not going to get a job here this is going to be crazy so sis is there anything to do in virginia she's like well, there's a lot of military and a lot of government stuff so i don't know maybe so i'm like you know what can i crash at your place i stayed at her place for a few days actually a few weeks i took some suits I printed some resumes cuz back then you print resumes, okay? Printed resumes and started door knocking to all these companies. Here's my resume, here's my resume, here's my resume. I wasn't getting no calls, but until what? That fifth or sixth day, I get one call. Hey, we saw your resume, we're interested in talking to you. Boom, I'm like, "Okay." Like 2 hours later I get another call. Just when you think things are not going right that you're not getting a call, boom, the blessings start pouring in. Hey, I got a job here, I got a job there, I got it. So now I'm picking where I want to go work. Ended up working for um really quick in Virginia for government contracting. I was able to travel. I worked with OSHA, I worked with TSA, I worked with Border Protection. So that was another corporate environment that I was exposed to that I never knew. and that taught me a lot too it taught me how to talk to people it taught me how to how to talk better you know 
just not that street thing and slang, but now to be corporate, to be professional, because this is a whole nother world, you know? So I come from New York, rough environment. I go to Colombia, beautiful environment, all the luxuries, all the nice things. And now I'm back over here. Those years, I stayed in Virginia for about eight years, actually, when I finished, you know, when I got that job. Uh, I traveled, met a lot of people. And like I said, just really got into the whole corporate mindset and and just working corporate jobs, you know, until I met one guy who sold cars, had a great lifestyle, or at least it looked like a great lifestyle. And I'm like, dude, Alex, his name was Alex, is Alex. What do you do? Oh, I sell cars in Virginia. I deal with high end Porsches and Jaguars and this and that. I make good money. I don't work too hard. And I'm like, sheesh. This is a little better than what I'm doing where I'm at, you know, following all these corporate rules and, 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 you know, it's, it's very strict. And then I see this guy just having fun, living his life. And I told him one day, I'm like, dude, can I work with you? So I got into sales. And one thing that I love about sales, you know, people get into, oh, cause I want to help people and this and that. Yeah, we all want to help people. That's part of your job. But I love sales. It was just the whole negotiation and, and how to leverage and how to how to take from here to get there. And and, you know, not that you're scamming people, but you got to have some type of finesse. And this guy, Alex, he was really good at finessing. He was really good at, at just talking and and, you know, charisma. And he was just a good salesman. And I loved it. And I seen that from my dad because my dad was a salesman all his life. My dad came home and told me stories on how he sold this $100 camera for $10,000, you know, because back then there was no Internet. You weren't going to Best Buy.com and comparing prices. You went to the store in New York in Times Square, which you know is expensive because it's New York. You would find the camera and these salespeople like my dad would just here's the camera. Here's how it works. Here's how it how it goes. And how much is it? My dad would see where they from, how they dress, how they look, how they act, how they talk. And from there, he would put a price on whatever. As long as he sold that camera for whatever the boss wanted, he could sell it for a lot more and he would keep that difference. That was the hustle that my dad had. So I always saw my dad in sales. Then I see Alex, this guy in sales. And I say, you know what? I love this. I love that game. It was a game. That's what I love. This is the selling game. So I got into sales. I started selling cars. I did very freaking well. You know, I remember selling my first Jaguar. My first car was a Jaguar. A black gentleman from Maryland. He worked for government. And I worked for government. So we had a little commonality there. So, of course, I finessed him to the point that he loved me. And I didn't lie to him or anything like that. I was, I just got to his, to his soft spots. I knew how to talk to him. And I saw that car, I remember for $4,800 more than it cost. And I was able to keep those extra $4,800. So I was like, man, this is, this is the job right here. So I did it for a while. I did the whole sales thing for a while in Virginia. And during my time in Virginia, my parents who were already in New York, they were already getting tired of the snow, the cold, and just the city in general, and my parents decided to come to um, to Florida, to Orlando, actually Kissimmee. And my parents bought a home, brand new. They had their home built. And while I was in Virginia, me calling my parents, my mom is like, mira, mijo, compramos casa, eh, casa nueva, la están construyendo, mira las fotos. So it was... It was like, wow, man, my parents now are back. They have a house all of a sudden. So I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go visit. When the house was built, I came down here and visited. And that's when I saw like, holy crap, Florida's pretty damn cool. Because even the ugly, bad neighborhoods that I know now I would not go into. Back then, I would drive by Pine Hills and be like, wow, this is beautiful. You know, grass, everybody's got a lawn, Every there's palm trees. I'm like, shit, Pine Hills is not bad. It's beautiful here. Yeah, right. Now that I know, it's like, I'm not going to Pine Hills. But hey, you know, it's not bad, but it's not my thing. Um, 
so yeah, I came down here. I'm like, damn, and how much you get this house, mom? And I remember her saying it was like 170 or something like that. I'm like, what? 170,000, a four bedroom, brand new. And I was thinking of buying in Virginia when I was there, like a 32 year old home for like 500,000 that probably needed another hundred grand just to get fixed. So I was a no brainer, you know, and then, of course, I was away from my parents for a very long time, you know, because all that time in Virginia, all the time that I was in New York, you know, there was a lot of times where I wasn't with my parents. So now my parents are getting a little older. And of course, you miss them because, you know, when you're young, you don't think about it. You don't care. Time is time. You know, well, I'll see them next time. But you get older and you're like, damn, you know, I need to be closer to them. So. That's when I said, you know what, forget Virginia. I think I'm moving to to uh, Central Florida. So that's when I decided to to leave Virginia, leave that cool life, because either I would work corporate or I can do sales. And I was doing both very well, so I could have stayed there. But nah, I wanted, you know, I wanted to chill with the family because you do miss them, you know. So now I'm here. I remember I told my mom, mom, I have some money. What is the best place close to the city you can find in Orlando? And back in Orlando 20 years ago, everything was still freaking country as hell. If it wasn't Mickey Mouse, everything was country, you know? So my mom was like, well, there's this place here called, you know, like the Millennia area by Mall of Millennia. It was kind of new there. And I'm like, okay, mom, is it country, like real country or what? She's like, no, it's close to downtown. There's a lot of stores and there's this mall called Millennia, really nice. And I'm like, all right, find me an apartment over there and um, and, uh, and I'll pay. I'll pay for it. So she found me an apartment in, uh, what's the name, Walden Place or Walden, Walden Apartments right here in Millennia. I moved to those apartments and um, I thought it was cool as hell, you know. Once again, palm trees, there was a little lake in the back, the grass is always green, the sun is always out. I'm like, man, this is not bad. So right now I just have savings, so I'm not working. And one of my neighbors, un colombiano, I see him always with two cars. He had a van and he had a regular car. And it looks like he was doing good for himself. So one day we crossed paths and I'm like, hey, parcero, what's up? Hey, what do you do? He's like, oh, I do cable. I'm like, what kind of cable? He's like, just regular cable TV installation. And I'm like, oh, really? How, is it good? He's like, I make decent money. I didn't have nothing to do. And it looked like it was quick. He's like, just get you a van, get some tools, and I'll put you to work. I'll, I'll, I'll refer you. And I'm like, but bought a van for like 2500 bucks. bought a bunch of tools, a ladder. I never even dealt with tools in my life. All of a sudden, here I am, Mr. Mr. Handyman. And I started working cable. You know, I started installing cable and I'm a big guy, you know, it's hot as hell in the summer. Imagine me, 95, 100 degree weather and you're climbing into these freaking attics doing cable. It lasted about eight months. I was dying. I couldn't do it no more. And I remember with a good friend of mine that I met over there. His name is Fredzi. Great guy. We used to partner up a lot because we were just have fun. You know, we, we had, we had fun every day. And one day we go to Publix cause that was our thing. Public sub, you know, and I'm reading the newspaper cause back then we still reading newspapers and stuff. And it says, want to make a hundred grand a year? Give me a call. And I called, I told them, dude, look at this. And we were just there in the van, chilling, eating, drinking, getting ready for the next job. So I called real quick. I'm on, let me see what this is about. Yeah, I see an ad that, you know, if you want to make a hundred grand a year, give you guys a call. So here I am. And it was this lady named Stacy. And she was kind of like the, the recruiter for for this company. And she tells me, oh, where are you from? And I talk to her and she's like, OK, and what do you do? And this and that. I'm, I'm bilingual. I'm this. I've worked in sales. And she's like, oh, OK, well, you know what? You want to come tomorrow in person uh, interview? And I'm like, hell yeah, I'll be there tomorrow. So I hang up. I tell my boy, Fredzi, I just called this place and I'm getting an interview tomorrow. And he's like, what? Let me call too. He calls. He also gets the interview. So we both, the next day, we take off. We're like, I ain't doing no cable. We get a little dressed up. We go to this place. Ends up being a resort. 
uh, a timeshare resort, which at that moment, it was great because I'm going into this resort, gated community, pools, more palm trees. Everything is perfect. Everything is beautiful. And I sit down with the recruiter and she's like, hey, we you know, small talk. And she's like, so you do sales, huh? OK, sell me this pen. That was always that 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 old school thing, you know. So we made conversations. I made her laugh. I sold her the pen. I don't remember exactly how it was, but I know I made her laugh. And she laughed and she's like, you know what? I like you. So when can you start? And I'm like, I can start right now because I'm done with cable. I'm done sweating. I'm done doing all this crap, working till 9, 10 o'clock at night, mosquitoes in your face. I'm like, I can work right now. Sure enough, next class was like two weeks later. And I got into the the crazy world of timeshare. <laughs> so timeshare, that's a whole different beast. It's a whole different animal when it comes to business. And I I did it very well. You know, I I sold and um I had a great time during the the, the timeshare days that we call it. But then again, everything that's good sometimes is not always good for you. And, you know, when you're young, you know, all you think about is making money and stacking money. And then, you know, that's all you want to do is just make money, you know, because if you make money, you get to buy cool stuff and go out and do cool stuff or whatever you think is cool. So live that life of timeshare for almost 10 years. And then, you know, timeshare started dwindling down when Internet was out. Now people were going to the resorts and you would sell them. Hey, you can get this timeshare for 20 grand, 30 grand, 40 grand, whatever it was. And they would come with their phone and say, well, eBay says I can get the same exact thing for a dollar. So the times were changing. Technology was ruining certain businesses and timeshare at one time was one of them. I was getting hurt. So you had to be super aggressive to sell timeshare when technology was coming. So when you say super aggressive, it was pretty much sell however, whatever it takes to sell. So, yeah, sometimes you would sell and sometimes you would stretch a lie. I mean, stretch uh, the truth and almost become a lie, you know. And like they always said in Timeshare, they always had a saying, um, if you don't pitch heat, you don't eat straight up. So, yeah, I got to a point where. The mature person in me, the adult in me, had a conscience. And I was like, you know what? This is not feeling good. To this day, I think I still have a voicemail from a gentleman that I sold from Mexico, Dario Guzman. I sold him $78,000 worth of timeshare. And I remember his wife fighting with him. Te dije, te dije que no compres esto. No vayas a comprarlo. I still sold it. He still bought it. And about a year and a half later, I get a, a voicemail from him, almost crying, saying, man, estoy perdiendo a mi mujer. Estamos ahora aquí en Texas. Mi crédito está horrible. His credit was done because he stopped with the whole timeshare. And timeshare is forever. You pay those maintenance and taxes for the rest of your life. So little things like that started bothering me. And, you know, your conscience gets to you. You know, I'm like, damn, you know, I don't think this is for me. So what did I do? I already had my real estate license. I've been at it for a while. And I always thought of doing real estate, but shit, when you're doing timeshare and you get to work at six in the morning, you sell and you're done by two, you can't beat that. And you're making 100, 200 grand a year just working five, six hours a day. It was tough. But I was like, yeah, I got to get out of this because it's a black hole. You know, you're always hunting for that next big deal. You're always hunting for that next big check. And sometimes you can go months without selling nothing and all of a sudden, boom, you hit it and you're back on it. And it's a vicious cycle always. So you're stuck there forever just trying to make it. And I was done with it. I had a little money set aside and I said, you know what? Let me get into real estate. It's not just about helping people, but I just like the negotiating of it. And why not negotiate it? And have a clear conscience on top of that. You know what I mean? So I got into real estate. I said, um, let's get this done. I met actually 
Jeremy and, and Jury from G World. That was actually my first real estate company brokerage that I went to. Had a good time. Everything was well. Learning. And life is going, you know. Now what? Six, seven years later, here I am, you know. And I know I'm consuming and making this in, in, into small. There's a lot more to say, but in a nutshell, my life has been has been crazy. A lot of ups and downs, a lot of adapting, I would say. And I think adapting and being a person who can adapt will make you a survivor no matter what. Especially when you're exposed to dirt poor and the luxuries of life and everything in between. We were able to live good and happy poor. We live good and happy rich. So ain't no big deal. You know, so here we are now, you know, years later in my 40s. Gray. Sometimes I color it because I can't accept my my age coming and creeping up behind me. But um, but yeah, that's that's Mike Columbinic and Mike in a nutshell. But it's not about me. It's about me. Gente. It's about you guys. You know, it's, I'm not the only one who has gone through experiences like this. I'm not the only one who's who's moved around. I'm not the only one whose parents made sacrifices. I'm not the only one who um who has gone through hardships, good stuff, bad stuff and still victorious, still have a pure heart. And I want a lot of you folks, I would love to sit down with y'all. I would love for you guys to, to comment, give me your experiences. You know, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there, a lot of business people who are successful, but behind the success, they have a whole bunch of stuff to talk about that can inspire me and, and, and a lot of other people, you know. So this is just the first one. So stay tuned, guys, because there's a lot more to my life. There's going to be a lot more of mi gente, you know, and that's what it's all about. You know, I want to embrace those people that have my story, those people that have parents just like mine and sit down and just chat it up, you know. So I'll see you guys for the next one. Yeah.